Well, tonight we're in 1 John chapter 4, and we're looking at love at its best. Love at its best. 1 John 4, verses 7 through 11. We'll take a look at what the Bible has to say here in 1 John 4, 7 through 11. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. <coughs> Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Let us pray. Father, we thank you tonight for these wonderful verses. They have a lot of truth. Uh, we ask that you would help us to uh, process uh, what John is, is uh, bringing to us tonight in this text. Uh, we ask that it would make us better believers, uh, help uh, make, make us better uh, witnesses for you, better examples in the community for you. And we know that uh, just these verses can do all that and more. So we ask that you might uh, work your power through the word tonight in all of our hearts and our lives. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to fill me now for this message. I trust and depend in you for that. I need your help, uh, big time, and uh, we want to hear from you. So uh, we praise you, we give you praise tonight, thanksgiving. Uh, we love you, Heavenly Father, and we ask uh, that tonight that we will really, really see that love that you have for us as our eternal God, our Father, our Savior, and the Holy Spirit. And we ask all this in Jesus' precious name, amen. John uses the word love a lot in his writings, and he does it here in 1 John as well. And primarily, he talks about three kinds of love in this book. Number one, he talks about God's love for us. He talks about our love for God. And tonight, we're looking at that third one, our love for one another. This is the third time that John is bringing this up. And so here in chapter 4, he comes to the pinnacle, the apex of what love really is. What is the source of love? The source of love is our awesome God. God is love. And there are three spiritual truths that we learn in these few verses. The first one is found in verses 7 and 8. And that is our first point tonight, love personified love personified in verses 7 and 8 beloved let us love one another for love is of god and everyone that loveth is born of god and knoweth god and here's the reverse of that he that loveth not knoweth not god for god is love Love is not like any other subject. It cannot be understood and then practiced. It can only be understood by practice. It's like sports. You get better because you practice and work and you become better at it. So love can only be understood by practicing it. The ev essence and evidence of Christian living is love. And we are commanded by God. We are commanded to love one another. And John gives us two reasons in our text for doing so. The first reason is love has its source in God. God is the author of love. God is love love. Love is not this sentimental thing that we think of in the world. It is not an emotional 
thing. It is not an Oprah group hug word. Love is far different from that. It is more than a description of how somebody feels. Love is way more than emotions. It's the biblical concept of agape love, which is an unconditional love that seeks the highest good for the one who is loved. It is a love of total commitment. And that is the love that God wants us to have for one another. When God says, I love you, he does not say, I love you if you do this or if you can accomplish that. He doesn't say, I love you because such and so. No, there is nothing in us that would cause God to love us. We are all a bunch of, we are a pack of filthy, rotten sinners. Tell yourself that in the mirror. If you haven't already, already done. That's what we are. Right? But God loves us anyway, doesn't he? Wow. How much, uh, how much love do we have for certain individuals in this world that are ruining it? You know? We are sinners. God's love is motivated by who he is. Not by who we are. It's motivated by who he is. God first loved us. There is nothing lovely about us. All you have to do is, is uh, sit down and meditate for a moment on all those thoughts that go through your mind in one day that are just unbelievable, wicked, rotten, sinful thoughts. They're there. Uh, there's nothing lovely about about us. God loves because it's his nature to love us. He is all about it. He is love. He desires that we know him. And so he extends his love towards us. We who are exhorted to love are already loved by God. This is the ground for the command to love others. We're already loved by God. God is love. He loved us. He loved us first. God's love is creative. It actually produces its likeness in us who know God. God is love. We know God and his love is created and it is produced in us as his children. Feelings come to us. Agape comes from us that unconditional love comes from the heart of god to our heart to others feelings are passive and receptive agape is active and creative feelings are instinctive agape is chosen we who know christ we choose to love we fall in love. We talk about love on earth. We fall in love with that special individual. But we do not fall in agape. We do not fall in agape. Our choice to love comes not from a nice day. It does not come from good vibrations. It does not come from a feel-good attitude. Man, I feel so good today. I'm just going to love everybody. No. It comes from a heart that knows God. It comes from the center of our being. The second reason we are commanded to love one another is that everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Verse 7. Two things are said here to be true about Christians who practice love. Christians who practice love. Two things. Number one, they have been born of God. We have been born again. And secondly, we know God. The presence of love in your life is an evidence of your Christian experience. 
You love. You choose to love. Christ loved us first. John is not talking about anybody in the world who has a feeling of love for somebody else and therefore they're a Christian. No, that's not what he is saying here. John is talking about the relationship that we have between God and other believers. The world does not have that. Uh, those of you who have children, they have your DNA. They are a lot like you. You have passed that on to them. I think of Sarah Schausberger. She has a laugh like her mother's. When she laughs, I think of Dinah. <laughs> when, when, I, when I look at the Strubies children, there's no question who they are. Those are Strubies. You know, we pass things on. Okay? Now, uh, like, like my children, uh, they look like their mother. And that's a good thing. <laughs> that's a, a really good thing. And so that got passed down from her daddy to her to my children. And we'll see where it goes from there. But uh, we pass down our DNA. We, they have our nature. We pass that on to them. And the same thing is true of those who have been born of God. We have the DNA of God. And he says, I'm telling you, I'm commanding you to love one another. Choose to love one another. But not only have we been born of God, we know God. We have an intimate relationship with God. It is more than knowing facts. We are rightly related to him. That intimacy is seen when we sit down with his word all by ourselves, and we meditate in his word and we ask the Holy Spirit to show us uh, what he wants us to get from this passage today. And it's a time that you have with God that nobody else ever has we know god we have an intimate relationship with our god it is a special time that that we have with him uh, some of the best times that i ever have is when i'm sitting at that desk up there in that corner room in the parsonage and i'm studying and, and working on and and the, the lord just floods me with things and nobody else is getting that at the time. I ain't just me. And it's just, a, a, it's just, and you just know that that is what's happening. You and God are having a time together. It's a special time. We know God. We have an intimate relationship with him. And God's love produces genuine change in us. And we keep changing as, as the days go by and the weeks go by and the months and the years. We are changing. We are continuing to be sanctified and, and brought along in the faith. And, and when we respond to God's love, we are able to be loving people. You cannot command unsaved people to love one another. No, it's, that's not in their, their bailer wick. It's just not there. But you, as a believer, as we are commanded to love, we have the capacity to love. And what John said in verse number 7, he emphasizes, as I said earlier, in his reverse comment in verse number 8, he says, He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. The unbeliever does not have that capacity. They need to be saved, then they can have that. Those who do not love in the way described by John in verse number 7 give evidence that they are not children of God. They do not know God. They do not love like you have the capacity to love. God created all things 
And he created us. He created the human race. And he chose to love us. What happened at the beginning? They rebelled. And we'd have done the same thing. They rebelled and they, they deserved eternal death. But God chose to love them and provide a way for their salvation. You know, uh, many times in my flesh, I don't think like that. It's no squash. Smash them like an ant on the sidewalk, you know? But that's not God. That's not our God. Our God loved Adam and Eve anyway. And immediately he gets to work to make a way for their salvation. God became man in the person of Jesus Christ and he went to the cross of Calvary to pay for the sins of the world. He made a payment there. He paid the debt. You know, what wondrous love is that? To pay for the sins of the world. The second spiritual truth is point number two, love proven. Love proven proven verse number nine gives us the grounds of god's love verse number nine in this was manifested the love of god toward us because that god sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him now we say that god's love is really great it is really stupendous but our words fail to really be able to express how awesome god's love really is to manifest something his love was manifested that means that he made it known he made it known the love of god was made known among us jesus was among us and provided eternal life through Jesus Christ. The greatness of God's love is shown in five ways. Number one, we want to notice that it was God's love that caused the mission of sending his son. There was a mission that Jesus had to undertake. Secondly, we notice who God sent. He sent his only begotten son. Thirdly, we see the greatness of God's love is revealed in the purpose of sending the son so that we might live through him. Fourth, the greatness of God's love is that it originates with God. It does not originate with us. And fifth, the greatness of God's love is demonstrated by its cost. God sent his son Jesus to be the propitiation for our sin. Look at verse number 10. Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins propitiation satisfaction to appease the wrath of someone and that is what jesus did he propitiated our sin he appeased the wrath of god the father he took care of our sin debt for us you know why why couldn't god just wave his magic wand and and forgive everybody's sin wouldn't that be simple? Wouldn't that be nice? I mean, he didn't even need the wand. Just say it. Well, to do so would violate something. It would violate his, what everybody's crying for today, justice. It would violate his justice. Propitiation includes six things in its definition. It includes God's holiness, his wrath, his justice, his mercy, his love and his grace. So we have God's love and we have God's wrath. God can be angry with sinners and love them at the same 
time he went to the cross that way. God is just, and he must punish sin. Has to happen. But in that, he is also merciful. God is love, and his love extends to all people. There is nothing that we sinners can do about getting our sins forgiven. There's nothing we can do. This is where God's grace enters the picture, the grace of God. So Jesus comes and he pays the price of our sin. He becomes our substitute on the cross of Calvary. He took the wrath that we deserve upon himself, satisfying God's judgment in payment for our sin. In Jesus' death on the cross, God's holiness, justice, wrath, mercy, love, and grace all converge. It's like all roads lead to Carlisle. Yep. When I came here, somebody told me that. All roads lead to, you, know, you won't get lost, all <laughs> All roads lead to Carlisle. Well, well, all these things converge at the cross and on the cross. God's holiness, his justice, wrath, mercy, love, and grace. They all meet on the cross. The initiative of propitiation is from God. He initiated the taking care of God's wrath against sin, against our sin. The response has to come from from us what does god do god moves towards us so that we can move toward him god first loved us so that we might be able to love him and to love others i have a story here about a famous baseball player i had never uh, seen or heard about this before but it's a really neat story it's about Ty Cobb. How many ever heard of that guy? Lot, oh, look at all. Okay, we must be old. I don't know. Ty Cobb was one of the all-time greats in the game of baseball. He had a .367 lifetime batting average with 4,191 hits, 892 stolen bases. He won nine straight batting titles. But Ty Cobb was also the meanest man in baseball. I didn't know that. The meanest man. Known for stopping at nothing to win. He would insult, humiliate, and even injure other players in his quest for victory. Even his own teammates once rooted against him when he was in a tight race one season for the batting title. He was known to make unprovoked racial slurs. He had three wives, all of whom he verbally and physically abused. He was constantly involved in fistfights, arguments, and tirades against fans and players. He once pistol whipped a would-be mugger so badly that the face of the corpse could not be identified. Some players, like the famous Ted Williams, tried to help Cobb, but to no avail. Cobb was worth millions because of his early investment in Coca-Cola. When he died, he had in his possession millions in stocks, bonds, and cash because he was an early investor in Coca-Cola. And yet, it would be hard to find a more apt specimen of total depravity. But the story does not end there. Not long before he died, Cobb was visited by a Presbyterian minister named John Richardson. Cobb curtly told the preacher to leave. Two days later, he returned. This time, Cobb listened as Richardson explained to him the plan of salvation. Hearing of Christ's love for sinners and how he had come to die for the likes of Ty Cobb, the, quote, Georgia peach was overcome with emotion. Richardson continued to explain the necessity of repentance towards sin and faith in Jesus as the only way of salvation. 
Cobb told the preacher he was ready to put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ as his Savior. Two days before he died, Cobb told Richardson, I feel the strong arms of God underneath me. That takes us back to verse number 10. Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And point number three, love practiced. Love practiced, and that is verse number 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. When you understand how much God loves you, we get it that we must love one another. Now that word ought here in verse number 11, that we ought to love. What does that word ought mean? The word ought there means it is an obligation that we have. It is not an option that we can choose. It is a obligation. Loving one another is not an optional choice. It is an obligation. Jesus did it and so we do it. DNA. We do it. There's, there's a little problem that comes up in church life. And that is that, that there are some believers that are difficult to love. And so here's that little phrase. To dwell above with saints I love, that will be glory. But to dwell below with saints I know, now that's another story. <laughs> so, our love for others should grow out of our love for God and his own love for us. If God loved us, th that, those words are a game changer. We remember who we are, and we love one another. The early church father named Tertullian tells us that he was brought to Christ by watching the lives of Christians, and he coveted what they possessed. What caused them to live the way they lived? And we read in the New Testament about one of the churches there that, that, that was a, a big influence because they, the people said, Behold, how they love one another. God sends us this love letter in the person of Jesus Christ. And that love letter can be summed up in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So we love every believer no matter what. We don't go with that little phrase. No, no, no. That little statement, that little saying. No, we love everybody no matter what. And the greatest of love you can show to those who don't know Christ is to do what? Tell them about Jesus. What if that Presbyterian preacher would have never went to see Ty Cobb? That would have been it. So there's somebody out there that needs to hear from us. And it could be that this week is the week that they need to hear from us. God is love father we thank you tonight for your power and your might and the, the power of this portion of scripture that we see here tonight and father there, there is no doubt that within this congregation of faith chapel there are so many folks that love one another it is definitely seen uh, tertullian would have been pleased had he walked in here and looked around because people love one another. May this always be the case. May it never, ever be toned down at all. Not ever. We ask that it only increases and increases as the days 
go by. It is a tremendous testimony to our great Savior who loved us and gave himself for us. We give you praise. We give you thanksgiving. We love you, Lord, and help us to have that love in our hearts for every single person that we ever meet. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please turn to hymn number 355. 355, I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small, but Jesus paid it all. 355, let's all stand together as we sing. Father, we thank you for the, the marvelous words of this hymn that we have just sung together and with enthusiasm. Uh, thank you, Lord, that we have a lot of love in this church. We love you. We love one another. And we're asking you to make that just keep on happening, growing, expanding. And uh, may we actually demonstrate that to this lost and dying world in which we live. They need to see that. They need to see the love of Christ. And they can see that from all of us here tonight. So go before us, lead us, guide us, direct our very footsteps that we may be well pleasing in thy sight and that much will be accomplished for the honor and glory of the Lord Jesus Christ in whose name we pray and ask it, amen.